Um, so uh, yesterday we talked about the random D complex mainly, and um, the other theory is heavy on the combinatorics. Um, and here um, today I want to talk about one type of a geometric complex. There are a few others, um, and he and here the analysis is more heavy on the stochastic geometry part. Um, so I will start. Uh, I'll describe to you the models uh, in my first talk, so I'll repeat it again because that was two days ago. Um, and I'll update the notation a little bit. So uh, we have a point set P in some metric space. Well, eventually I said I'm going to narrow it down to points on the D dimensional flat torus. Um, and then I'm looking at the union of the balls of radius, not R, but rather R over two around the points. So that's this object on the left. Um, the random geometric graph, or sorry, it's not yet random, but the geometric graph on this set of points would be uh, whenever two balls intersect, you place an edge, or if you want, when the distance between two points is less than R, you add an edge. So that's the object in the middle. And the check complex is a higher dimensional generalization of that, where we also uh, include higher dimensional simplexes whenever uh, three balls, for example, intersect like here, then we will place a two dimensional face. And if we have, uh, generally, if we have K plus one balls that intersect, we will put the corresponding K dimensional simplex. Um, so this is the model I want to describe now, um, where the point process I will be taking is a, a Poisson point process on the flat torus. I'm taking the unit box and identifying the opposite sides. Uh, and it's homogeneous with the rate, fixed rate of N. Um, the degree distribution in this case, the number of neighbors each vertex has, has a Poisson distribution with a parameter which I'm going to call big lambda, since we're going to use lambda again and again. And lambda is given over here. So it's, um, it's given by uh, n, which is the, the rate of the process, or so the average number of points. And then we have uh, a second term, which is uh, omega d r to the d. r is the radius, omega d is the volume of a unit ball. So overall, uh, this is uh, the volume of a ball. OK, uh, so this is lambda. Um, <clears throat> so that's the expected number of uh, points in a ball or the expected uh, degree of a vertex in this complex old graph. Okay. Uh, and the phenomena I want to talk about are very similar to the ones I told you about yesterday, namely uh, this homological connectivity and the appearance of cycles and so on. But there are gonna be uh, differences between um, the phenomena we, we saw yesterday and the ones to... Uh, but I'm gonna start with uh, sort of the fundamental result for, for uh, or the very, one of the very first results for random geometric graph, very similar to um, the one we saw for the erdos rennie graph, which is the, the phase transition for connectivity. Okay, and it looks very much like the Erdős and Rennie theorem. So we take the geometric random gra graph, GR, we ask what is the probability that this thing is connected. And in the limit, if the expected degree is slightly above or slightly below log of n, we have that the probability goes to either zero or one. Um, so in the, in the Erdős and Rennie uh, random graph, we have n times p between, uh, above and below log n, which was the expected degree. And here, lambda is the expected degree coming from the volume of the ball. But otherwise, it's similar. And if you are inside the critical window, you can also show Poisson convergence for the number of components and consequently the exact limit of the probability for connectivity. So it's a similar, very much like uh, the one before, and everything depends on the degree. Uh, and it's coming from roughly the same kind of argument, if I remind you, in the and running graph, we saw that um, right before connectivity, we have a giant component and isolated vertices. And then the phase transition depends on the isolated vertices. So here, uh, generally, the same idea, the same thing happens. And if we ask what is the expected number of isolated points or isolated vertices like we had before, then in order for a vertex now, if this is my vertex and I want it to be isolated, I need to make sure it has no neighbors. So I need to draw a ball of radius r and make sure that this ball contains no, no other points. Uh, so I have average of n vertices, so the rate of the process, and then the probability for the degree to be zero is e to the minus lambda. Um, 
right? Because this is this ball has a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda, so that's the um, probability. And now, if you take lambda to be above or below log n, you'll get that this thing converges either to zero or blows up to infinity. Uh, the the other steps of the proof are again similar in spirit, but much more complicated because we don't have uh, all the the nice independence and the nice counting properties that you can do with the um, uh, addition Rani, but uh, the idea is the same. Okay. Uh, now, before uh, what I want to do eventually is to take the check complex, which is the high dimensional generalization of this graph, and tell you about homological connectivity, namely the sort of convergence of the homology on that um, complex. Uh, but before that, I want to highlight a couple of differences between the check complex and the D complex that we saw yesterday. Um, yes, I'm here. Um, so in the D complex, we studied before, and the first phenomenon we looked at was homological connectivity. So we said that, that we're looking at the D minus one cycles. And this thing, if you increase P, and you think about this process as, as growing with P, then uh, you, as you have more and more D simplexes, you have less and less D minus one cycles because they get filled in, right? You start with a lot of holes like here, and each triangle that you add in can kill one of the holes until you have no holes at the end. Um, so when P is uh, large enough, and we saw that large enough here means that uh, N times P is roughly uh, D log N. Then we saw yesterday that uh, homology vanishes. All the cycles are filled in and we have left with nothing. Uh, in the check complex, uh, there are two key differences now. First of all, uh, here the homology was decreasing. We have many, many holes and every face just kill the hole, and, but we cannot create new ones. Uh, in the check complex, it's not the same. You can see here four snapshots of the complex as I increase the radius. And as I increase the radius, I might create cycles. Things will get connected. And then eventually, I'm adding more and more uh, two-dimensional faces that will kill those cycles that I've created, and so on. In, in every dimension, cycles can uh, appear and then fill in later. So nothing here is monotone. Uh, and another difference is that as opposed to the random D complex, well, there's no underlying structure. Here, if the radius is large enough, like um, uh, for example, here I'm sampling the points from, from a, an annulus, but in our example, we'll be looking at the torus. Uh, then I expect the points to be dense enough. So the complex should look roughly like the underlying space. Like here it's looked like, sorry. Here the complex, at least topologically, looks like an annulus. And uh, if I sample from the torus, I would expect the homology uh, of my complex not to vanish, not to disappear, but rather to become the same as whatever is underlying uh, my points, which in our case would be the torus. So I expect it to, be, to have the same homology as the torus and not to disappear. So these are two important differences. And therefore, we're going to have to slightly redefine what we mean by homological connectivity. Um, and that will be the following definition. Um, so I'm defining a new event. I'm calling it a curly age uh, with two indexes k and r. Uh, well, what I'm asking is, uh, I'll think about it as the convergence of hk. Namely, hk, as we increase the radius, can change. Cycles can appear or disappear, born or die, we call it sometimes. Uh, and I'm looking for the uh, for a radius such that if we keep increasing the radius for any larger s, the homology doesn't change and it's uh, fixed to be the homology of the underlying torus. Okay. So I'm looking for a point where I see the torus in my homology and I see nothing else and there are no more changes. So, it, And this, this event, I call it a curly H, K, and R. Uh, and notice that since I defined it this way, since I'm defining it not for a particular choice of radius, but rather for any S bigger than R, then I'm getting an, an event which is monotone. Once this event occurs, it will keep happening for any larger radii. So you can think about it as we have a process where homology changes, and at some point it converges, and it converges to the value which is the same as the torus. So we were looking for that uh, event to happen. And um, the theorem that we can prove for this event is another phase transition, namely that the probability changes from zero to one, but now the, the point where the transition happened looks slightly different than what we saw yesterday. So um, 
we have this theorem here. So the probability jumps between zero and nine. It's a sharp phase transition. Um, the um, degree of homology. So we're looking for homology at degree K. Uh, we can have various degrees. Uh, I forgot to write it down, but um, uh, roughly I'm being a bit sloppy, but um, the degrees here will go between K and even D. So, uh, So this is almost accurate, but for any k between one and d, all the possible cycles that can appear in the complex, we have a, a corresponding phase condition where um, k appears here. So it's in a second order log, uh, log log n term rather than the first order term. And we also have this two to the d constant here, uh, which if I compare to the result I showed you at first uh, for the graph, then in the graph case, um, connectivity happened at log n. So, uh, for H0, for connectivity, the, the space transition happens uh, around log of n. And for the higher dimensional uh, cycles, it's, it happens at some um, um, constant multiple of this threshold. And there are different phase transitions uh, where the difference is in the second order term. Okay. Uh, I tried to explain to you where all these differences come from, but this is the theorem that, that we have. Omer, there was yeah. a question in the chat by Daniel oh. Cook, who is asking, what about R on the right side? What about uh, R? So, so R is hidden over here. Um, so lambda is, in fact, n times R to the D times some constant. So uh, lambda is a function of the radius. So when I'm saying lambda is equal to something, I'm actually describing what is the choice of radius. So it will be the same as saying that R is roughly like log n over n to the one over d times, uh, yeah, so thank you for the question. Okay, uh, I'm not going to get into most sort of details uh, of the proof, but I want to tell you sort of what is the main idea here. And the main idea is to, uh, it's coming from a field called the uh, Moore theory, uh, connecting analysis and, and topo uh, algebraic topology. And it narrows down here to talking about critical phases. So what do I mean by that? Uh, if you think about the check complex and I'm increasing the radius, uh, faces keep coming up. At, at various radii, I'm gonna see new faces appearing, uh, joining the complex. And I wanna find critical faces of those simplexes that will change the homology. Okay. And turns out that in this check complex, uh, whenever new faces, whenever I hit a radius when, and a new simplex enter the complex, uh, it happens in a very particular way. So whenever new simplexes enter the complex, there's, it's always in a, uh, they come in a, in, a, in a sequence like this. So I have two dimensions, K1 and K2. And then um, basically in each radius, for each radius I have um, two values K1 and K2 and I have K faces entering where the number of new K faces is uh, by this binomial term. And here you can see an example. So suppose that I have two triangles in my complex. And then at some radius, what will happen is that I'm gonna have those three uh, constructions. So I'm gonna have one edge added over here. And together with this edge, now I'm gonna add two triangles. This is one and this is two. Okay, so this is two choose one. And then I'm gonna have another three dimensional simplex entering. Uh, and overall, I'm gonna get this shape on the right. So I'm gonna get, I'm starting with two triangles and I'm ending, uh, ending this process with a three-dimensional tetrahedron, okay? And this is generally what happens. Every time I have a sequence of faces that will enter well, with the binomial number for, for every dimension. And there are two options, uh, basically. Either K1 is less than K2, so either I have a real sequence of faces, but in that case, one can show that the homology will not change at this radius. So whenever I have more than a single simplex entering and there are not gonna be any change. And we can see here in, see it in the example here. So what you see here is that I have two edges already and these two balls are not yet intersecting. Therefore the triangle is not yet entered, but also uh, the edge here was not added yet because the two balls didn't touch. What will happen uh, when, I, when the two balls will touch, then when the two balls touch, first of all, I'm adding this edge because I have an intersection of the two balls. But also at the same time, uh, I'll have to add 
the triangle. Right? So here I'm adding a sequence of two faces, one in dimension one and one in dimension two. I'm adding a, an edge and a triangle at the same time. And indeed, nothing in the topology on the, in the homology changed, right? I had, um, I had the, this uh, two edges here, which has no, have no cycles in them. And I ended up with a full triangle, which also have no cycles in, in it. So whenever it's a, it's a real sequence, there are no changes. The only changes will happen when I'm adding a single, um, a single simplex. And this you can see in the picture here. So here I, I actually have a hole. So I have three balls, they do not touch each other. Uh, so there is a hole in the structure and there is, a, oh, there is a hole here in the triangle. And once the three balls will intersect, there's only gonna be one simplex that will enter the complex, um, right? So this triangle will join the complex and this triangle is gonna fill in the hole that was there, okay? So this happened uh, due to the fact that there was only one simplex that was added, okay? so. These are the only two changes that can happen. In the first one, we have new simplexes, but nothing changed in the terms of the K cycles. And in the second one, uh, there's one of two things that can happen. So if K1, K2 are both the same value, then either a new K cycle is born or an existing K minus one cycle dies, it gets filled in. So here, for example, we had a one cycle and I added a two simplex to kill. So this kind of faces that enter the complex, I'm gonna call them critical faces because those are the things that change my homology. Those are the things that create cycles and kill cycles. Okay. And the, the point underlying the proof is to look for those things that change my homology and try to say something about those. Uh, an important comment here would be that, um, notice that since this triangle here was added alone, it means that when I'm adding it, it's not part of any higher dimensional simplex. It's not part of any tetrahedron because it is added by itself. So in, in that sense, it's um, what we called last time, it's gonna be an isolated simplex, okay? So this is a connection to, to, to the result we saw yesterday. The, the changes in homology here are related to those isolated uh, simplexes, but in a more complicated way than what we saw yesterday. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip some parts of the proof. Uh, I will leave it in the slides, but uh, the idea is just to, to start counting those simplexes and in particular count critical faces or critical simplexes that are about to appear in the future. So right now I'm looking at the given radius R I'm looking at all the possible radii to come and I'm counting how many, um, I forgot to say um, that um, right, the, the ones that create cycles, I'm gonna call them positive and the one that kill cycle, I'm gonna call them negative faces. So I'm gonna count how many positive faces I have, how many negative faces I have and how many face, crit, critical faces I have in total. Um, now there are, uh, quite of uh, complicated calculations to to analyze those quantities and to find the limit of those the limiting behavior. I'll, I'll skip the details, but I'll just show you the the main idea of, of behind the proof. So this is again the theorem that we have. So we have this faint addition, and what you can show basically is that if you're above the threshold, like here, you can show that the number of positive k-dimensional faces or and the number of negative k plus one dimensional faces. Uh, is becoming zero. That means that if these two quantities are zero, then the, there are no more changes to the K cycles because nothing is creating more K cycles. This thing that's supposed to create K cycles is zero. And this thing that is supposed to kill K cycles is also zero. So at this point, if we can prove that, then we can show that there are no, um, no more changes. Okay, so if, if we, Right. We thought about this event as a sort of a convergence event, the point where there are no more changes. So we know that here, if we reach that, then there are no more changes. Um, now, so that's only one part of the proof, right? We, we need to show not only that there are no more changes, but also that there is this equality. And this equality comes from the fact that if, if the radius is as large as we want it to be, then at some point, the bores around the points are gonna cover the entire torus. 
Okay? And if the balls cover the torus, then the homology should be the same as the torus. And we know that, I forgot to mention it before to remind you, but we saw that the balls and the complex have the same homology. This is what we call the nerve limb. So anything we can say about the ball applies to the, to the complex. Uh, so if the ball cover the torus and are eventually the same, then uh, we can say that the homology at this point of the torus is the same as the homology of the complex. Okay. So if we can find a radius such that A, there are no more changes, and B, uh, for larger radius, we know that we have the correct homology, then we know that the hom connect uh, homological connectivity event that we're looking for has happened. And that's, that's the uh, main idea behind the proof for the, for the upper bound. Um, so it's coverage together with uh, the vanishing of those critical faces. Uh, the lower bound is uh, conceptually easier, but the, the, the technical proof to, to, sh to show the limits is harder. Um, <clears throat> so, sorry. Um, so here, if we're below uh, the threshold, uh, what we can show is that the number of positive faces is with high probability positive, non-zero. That means that um, looking into the future, there are still uh, positive faces to appear, namely that uh, more K cycles are about to be created. And so if, if we're looking for the point where things have converged, namely there are no more changes, it's not, it hasn't happened yet because we know that cycles are going to still be created. And therefore we know that this homological connectivity event hasn't happened. And in a way, uh, I remind you that those critical faces are isolated faces uh, and showing that we have uh, those positive faces um, that keep generating cycles is sort of similar to the idea of isolated vertices and isolated faces that we had in the combinatorial models yesterday that, uh, that were also the thing that sort of um, interferes with homological connectivity. So as long as we have these positive things, we, we keep seeing cycles and therefore uh, we don't have homological connectivity. So that's the main idea behind um, the proof of this phase transition. Uh, now using these critical phases, we can also show a Poisson limit like we had yesterday for the, for the D complex. And this comes uh, in this theorem over here. So the Poisson limit will be for the number of critical faces. So what we can show is that the number of critical faces, either positive or negative or total, uh, converge to the same thing. They all have a limit of a Poisson distribution if we are inside the critical window. So we're in between the, the transition here. And that will also give us uh, the exact limit for the probability uh, of homological connectivity inside that window. Um, so essentially everything here relies on the, this analysis of those critical faces, uh, which now it's not only combinatorics, it's also a lot of uh, complicated stochastic geometry and, and the proofs here are uh, more involved. Uh, I just want to comment that the, the, the proof here for the Poisson limit is also, it's much harder here to calculate moments and, and uh, we cannot use the, the method of moments here. We uh, sort of, um, we had to, uh, this is a separate paper with uh, Matthias Schulte and Yogeshwaran uh, uh, Pani, and it hasn't been published yet, but we um, we devised this uh, Poisson process, process approximation for um, for object like these critical phases, which are uh, defined on Poisson process, but um, they have, uh, they may depend on the, on some random uh, neighborhood of, of um, of the points. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, one thing I want to highlight before I move to describe another phenomenon is the following. Um, so the difference between connectivity and homological connectivity. So I told you at the beginning that connectivity, which we can consider as H0, happens when in the threshold, which is log of n, when the degree is log of n. On the other hand, all the other homological connectivities results uh, phase transition happen at some fixed constant times log n, two to the d. Uh, so they happen at a different point. Uh, if you translate it from lambda to the radius, then it means that the, the radius for the kth homological connectivity is roughly twice the, the radius that you need to achieve connectivity. And the question 
I want to try to give an intuition answer for intuitive answer for is why is this uh, multiple of two here in the radius? And the reason is uh, sort of the difference between isolated vertices that we need uh, when we analyze connectivity versus the isolated or critical K faces that we need when we, when we analyze the um, the homological connectivity. So for the isolated vertices, we said that we look at the vertex, we look at the ball of radius R around it and make sure there are no neighbors, no other points lies inside this ball. And for that, we know that the probability for a vertex to be isolated is this e to the minus lambda. On the other hand, when we look at a, at a, at a simplex or a face and we want this face to be isolated. So first of all, we want this face to be part of the complex. And for, the, for, for example, if this edge is part of the complex, then the radius here uh, is r over two. The distance between the point has to be r. And, the, um, and then if I want, it to be isolated, it means that I, I don't want any other simplex uh, to include this edge. Namely, I don't want any other ball uh, to intersect with this point in the middle, right? If I'm gonna have, for example, um, a third point inside here, then it means that the ball around it will also, sorry, that was just it. The ball around this point will intersect with the two other balls, and therefore I'm going to get a triangle. Okay. Uh, so any point inside this ball of not radius r, but rather radius r over two, will now create a simplex and make this edge be not isolated. So in order for an, a, an edge or any other simplex to remain isolated, I need to look not in, at balls of radius r, but rather at balls of radius r over two. Uh, and that gives me this, oh, sorry. And since I'm looking at the volumes of this ball, then um, this will end up being um, with the factor of two to the minus d. Okay. Uh, and the difference between those exponents is exactly the difference between the threshold here. And that's exactly the difference between the radii. So that's why I need a twice the radii, twice the radius uh, for connectivity in order to achieve homological connectivity. Um, Okay, so this is the, the first phenomenon I wanted to, to tell you about. Uh, again, the, the, the stage where the homology of the complex stabilizes, converges, and becomes identical to, to the underlying space. In this case, it was the torus, but we can prove it uh, roughly for uh, any compact, uh, smooth Riemannian manifold. Uh, okay. Another phenomenon that I want to tell you about uh, which I didn't have a chance to tell you about yesterday in the context of the D complex uh, is related to percolation and the appearance of giant cycles or giant components in graphs. Um, so in, in, the, in the GNP model, as well as in the ge geometric model, uh, there is a phenomenon which is uh, related to percolation, the appearance of the giant component, which is briefly described here. So uh, if lambda, if the expected degree in our model is fixed to be some value, and we denote by L the size of the largest component, say the number of vertices, then um, there is some critical value lambda C such that above this value, um, the largest component has order N number of vertices and below that it's a uh, log of N. Okay? So there's a phase transition where the largest component jumps from being uh, logarithmic in N to being of order N. Uh, this was proved mainly by Penrose and Penrose and Pistor. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and a similar thing happened to the GNP, but we didn't talk about it yesterday. Another important thing to say is that the giant components, once it appears, it's a unique component. So it's one giant component and everything else is much smaller than that. And the question that we wanna address now is whether we can, now we look, instead of the graph, we look at the complex, is there a giant something higher dimensional that appears in the check complex that we can describe in a similar fashion? Um, and uh, just a quick reminder. So um, we're gonna move now from the combinatoric realm of the complex to the stochastic geometry and think more about the union of the balls, which are equivalent. Okay, so the balls around the points and the check complex are, have the same homology. So now we're gonna move to talk mostly about the, the balls. And in that sense, we will describe two processes. One is the, the union of the balls. We're gonna call it the occupancy process. 
And one will be the complement of that, which is also useful for us, and we're going to call it the vacancy. Okay. So mainly for the purpose of defining the vacancy, we, we need to move to look at the balls. And in the theory of, of continuum percolation, it's called, uh, it can be shown that uh, each of these processes, the occupancy and vacancy, have this phase transition where a giant component appears, and they have different thresholds. Uh, we'll call, we're going to call them lambda C for the occupancy, a lambda bar C for the vacancy. Uh, in most cases, they are separated, except for dimension two, where one can show that these two thresholds are actually the same. Uh, but in general, there are two phase transition. Um, and another thing I want to mention is that if you take um, points inside a box, rather than the torus that we're looking at, then part of the theory shows that this giant component also create, uh, is able to create paths that go uh, from one face to the other, from left to right, top to bottom, in whatever dimensions you have. So these are called crossing paths. So uh, below the critical value, there are no crossing paths, and above, there are. So this is also going to become useful later. Uh, and now, again, what I want to do eventually, uh, if we take a little bit, but uh, I want to come up with an idea of something like this giant component, but in higher dimension and related to the homology. And the motivation for the definition that we came up with eventually uh, can be given here. So suppose that I'm not sampling points from the torus, now I'm sampling them from two separate boxes. So I have points here and I have points here, and I'm looking at the union of the balls or the check complex for that matter. Uh, then uh, it's quite conceivable that there are some critical values such as above that, I'm gonna see a giant component here and a giant component here. And those are gonna be separated because the radius of the ball is too small for things to move, uh, connect from here to here. Uh, so there's a, the blue one here, right? And you see, I draw it so that it crosses this box from left to right, top to bottom, and also here it crosses the box. So, um, so we expect that to be two giant components. In other words, uh, there is a correspondence between the giant components in the process and the components of the underlying support where the points are generated. And using this um, sort of realization, you can now try to think about what would be a nice uh, generalization for high dimension. Uh, and what you can do is just erase the word component and replace it with the word uh, zero dimensional cycles uh, on both sides because in homology, uh, connected components is just a zero dimensional cycle, something in H zero. And the next step to do is to say, okay, I don't need to necessarily focus on dimension zero. I can ask for the K dimensional cycles in my complex that correspond to the K dimensional cycles of the support. Okay. Uh, and that's what, that is what we eventually gonna be looking for. So we're looking for a point very much like here, the connected component represented the underlying support I'm going to look for cycles that represent cycles, K cycles in the support. In our case, it's in torus. Uh, and this is the, the formal way to do that. Uh, it's not uh, super important for what I'm going to tell next, but there is a, a, a rigorous uh, algebraic way to define it. So we're going to look at the inclusion map from the balls into the torus. And then there is a corresponding map from the homology of the balls to the homology of the torus, we denoted by I star. And what we're looking for is all the cycles that are in the union of the balls that are also true cycles in the torus. Yeah? And this would be uh, denoted by the image of this map. Everything which is non-zero in this image is a cycle that is both in the torus and in the random complex. And visually, you can think of it as what you see here. So this is the, the torus where I think of it as the box. If I take a path that starts here, go all the way to the other side and comes back, then this will be a one cycle. It's a loop and it's a loop that also belongs to the torus. Okay. So I'm looking for this kind of object. This will be considered by me as a giant cycle. On the other hand, if I have a small loop over here, then it might be a loop in my complex. The balls might create this small hole, but it's not a real hole in the torus. In, in the torus, everything is filled in. So I don't care about those small things. I care about the big thing that's are part of the homology of the torus, okay? And these are my way of thinking of a giant cycle that correspond to, or in a way, not exactly, but in a way, the generalized idea of a giant component. 
this is just a, a simulation example for how it looks on the three-dimensional torus. So on the three-dimensional torus, we will have giant cycles in dimension one and two. So here uh, you see, uh, it's, it's very hard to see them, but uh, you have three curves. Basically, the, each of them is co corresponding to one of the one cycles. So there's one goes from left to right, top to bottom, front to back. Okay, so we have three of them and uh, it's hard to see, but they loop around somehow. Yeah, they come back from the other side. Uh, in dimension two, it's, it's even harder to see, but in dimension two, basically, I mean a collection of triangles or surfaces that uh, create this kind of air pocket that is also one of the two cycles of the three-dimensional torus. So I remind you, the three-dimensional torus has uh, beta k is um, three choose k. So it has three one-dimensional cycles and three two-dimensional cycles. And you see each of them, the appearance of each of them here. So these are three different cycles and you can think of it as surfaces parallel to one of the faces. So each um, one of the faces of the box, each such surface will give you a two-dimensional cycle. So we're looking for the appearance of this, for the formation of this kind of cycles, which we consider as giant cycles. Uh, and here's the, the theorem that we were able to prove so far. Um, so the results here are not sharp. There is some kind of a transition, but it's not yet in the form of a sharp trail transition that we would like it to be. But um, this is what we have. So there are two parts to the theorem. First of all, we can show that there is a sequence of critical values indexed by the dimension, such that if I'm below, this is lambda minus. So if I'm below lam lambda k minus, I can show that uh, the probability to see any of those giant K cycles exponentially goes to zero. Okay? So the probability to see any of the loops is going to zero to so the probability to see below lambda one, to the probability to see any of the two dimensional surfaces uh, below lambda two exponentially goes to zero and so on. And there is a, another sequence of values uh, denoted with a plus, so that if you above this critical value, then the probability to see not one, but all the uh, giant cycles in dimension K. Sorry, I, I forgot to mention it, but GC would stand for a giant cycle. Then that goes to one in, in an exponential way. Okay, so we have two sequences of thresholds and above one, you're guaranteed to see the cycles and below the other, uh, you will not see any of them. Uh, what we know to say about the threshold is that um, obviously the, the minus ones are less smaller than or equal to the positive ones. So that makes sense. Uh, for the one dimensional cycle, we actually can prove a sharp result. So for the one dimensional cycle, we can prove for the loops, basically, we can prove that the plus and minus thresholds are the same. So there's only one point with a sharp transition and the value of it is equal like, to the critical value in continuum percolation to the appearance of the, to the same threshold as where the giant component appears. So basically when the giant component appears, it also includes one dimensional cycles. Uh, for the top dimension, d minus one, uh, we can also show a relation to the to lambda bar. I remind you that's the critical value for the vacancy process for the complement of the balls, uh, and we can show that the last threshold is bounded by um, the point where the giant component appears in the complement in the vacancy. So this is the result that we have. Uh, I have a few minutes, so I'll tell you briefly the idea behind the proof. Uh, at least for um, for for dimension one. So for dimension one, uh, the idea is to use the results from percolation. Basically, uh, if you're below the critical value, then a result which most most recently was proved by uh, this group, uh, Dominion Copan, uh, Ralph Intacion, that the probability to see any component of any fixed size, any fixed diameter is very small. It's exponentially small, uh, right? And if you want to create, in other words, if you see a cycle, then it has to be bounded by some region. And if it has to be bounded by some region, it cannot be one of the giant cycles because it has to wrap around. Uh, so in particular, if there is a, if I see this red cycle, it has to be filled in. It cannot be one of the giant cycles. Uh, so I conclude that, um, um, the minus threshold for the one cycle is at least greater or equal to the to this critical value. On the other hand, um, if I'm above 
the threshold for the critical values. Namely, when I have a giant component in the box, uh, then there is um, a theorem in continuum calculation that tells us the following. You can take, uh, now I'll think about this as the box. I can uh, divide the box into slabs of some fixed uh, thickness, okay? And then there is a, th uh, a lemma telling you that um, the probability to connect any two points within the slab uh, is bounded from below by some fixed value delta. Okay, so pick any point in the slab. In particular, I will choose these two points, for example. So the probability that these two points are connected within this slab is bounded from below by a fixed constant that doesn't depend on n. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I want these two points to be connected. So that has a probability bounded from below. Now, if these two points are connected in the box, once I move to the torus, that's going to create a cycle because I, I chose them so that this thing will be glued to that part. Uh, okay, so that's in one stop, but I can look at all the stops and ask for just to have in one of them to have such a path. So I'm, I'm going to be looking for each of the slabs and in each of them, I want to look to see whether I can find the path that sort of goes and wraps around. Okay. And the point is to show that the probability that at least in one of these slabs, uh, I can find a path that goes from left to right this way that will create, generate a one cycle in the torus uh, is exponentially going to one. And that's the, the idea above criticality. And again, it's coming from the continuum population theory. Okay. So eventually uh, what we do is the following. We have the number of slabs that we have is n to the one over d. And then the probability that there is a one giant cycle uh, is one minus the probability that we don't have any such cycle in any of the slabs. And this is exponentially high. And then you can show that the same applies to, to all the giant cycles. So at the end of the day, if I'm below lambda c, all the components are small, I cannot generate a one cycle. If I'm above it, then at each slab, uh, I have some positive probability to find a cycle and therefore there must be one uh, eventually. And from that, I conclude that um, uh, those two thresholds are the same and this phenomenon is sharp. Uh, the one last bit I wanna tell you about is uh, just how we move on from the one dimensional uh, proof the proof of k equals one, which heavily relies on the connected components to either dimension. And that's actually a topological argument, uh, which is also similar to things seen in, in percolation theory, uh, which is a kind of duality. And the way you think about this duality is the following. So suppose I'm looking at the three dimensional torus now, uh, and the green represents the occupancy process. And suppose that there is a two dimensional cycle in the green, in the occupancy. Then if I have this two dimensional surface, in the occupancy, then in the complement, I will not be able to create this kind of path that crosses from top to bottom. So either I have the surface on the left, which is a two cycle, or I have the path on the right, which is a one cycle, but I cannot have both of them. And so without getting into the details, the duality that we can prove is that uh, if I have, I have all the K dimensional giant cycles in the occupancy process, if and only if I have none of the complement cycles in the vacancy process. And for example, if I want to look now, so I can use the result that I have for um, continuum percolation on the vacancy process and then roughly do the same thing. So I can now go to dimension D minus one uh, and then look at one cycles in the vacancy process and use similar arguments to uh, what we did before. So I'm looking at one cycle. So I'm looking at giant components in the vacancy process do the same kind of procedure. And then I can conclude something for uh, the one cycle in the vacancy and eventually for the D minus one cycles in the occupancy. Uh, so I can do that. And then another, uh, a few other arguments are needed in order to complete the sequence in between. So we start with the one cycles, then from the duality, we can do the D minus one cycles. And then with a few other arguments, we can fill in the, um, the rest and, and have this uh, sequence of uh, threshold that I showed you in the, in the theorem, I don't have time to get into any more detail. I just, the last bit I want to tell you that what we conjecture to be true is that the result is stronger than what we were able to prove so far in the sense that there is only one true threshold for every dimension. So it's a sequence of uh, sharp phase transitions uh, and it's, uh, there is a sharp inequality between them. So the, first of all, the one, giants one cycles appear 
and later the two cycles appear and later the three cycles and none of the threshold coincides. But this is, at this point, it's still a conjecture and we don't have a proof for that. So this is, a, 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 in my view, at least it's a nice generalization of uh, results from continuum percolation uh, to higher dimension in homology. There are other ways to view, uh, to think about percolation phenomena in, in simplicial complexes, but uh, I do not have time to get into those. Um, so just to conclude, uh, on, in the case of the random geometric complexes, there are also a lot of other results I didn't show to you. Uh, you can look instead of the torus at, at more general Riemannian manifolds. And instead of a Poisson process, there's also a little bit of results on the uh, general stationary point processes. Uh, instead of looking at homology and um, Betty numbers and so on, there are some results about the distribution of the topological types, how many different kinds of objects can appear in the complex. There's also an, a, an object called persistent homology, which is a kind of a, a multi-scale version to look at homology, not at a particular radius, but rather at the sequence of radii, uh, very useful in applications in topological data analysis. And um, there are also some results about that. Uh, there's some extreme value analysis, um, sort of what happens if you, your distribution is not in a compact support, but rather like a normal distribution and you have outliers, how does those outliers behave and so on. So there are many, this theory of random geometric complexes is, is also quite big. Uh, and I will conclude with that. Uh, thank you for uh, listening. <laughs>